My name is Donald Zuckerman. I'm Colorado Film Commissioner, and I've been a professional in the film industry for, I guess, about uh, 25 years, and uh, dabbling a little bit in television, trying to get more in it. We have an esteemed panel here, and the way it's going to work is everybody is going to talk a little bit about themselves and what they do and how they got involved in what they do, and then we're going to have a big Q&A afterwards. So it's mainly going to be a Q&A. So we're going to start with Carol. Carol, really? please. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you want me to do? OK. So talk about yourself. <laughs> Tell everybody what you do. Hello, everybody. I'm Carol Bush. I work here at Colorado State University in the Department of Communication loud, Studies. Loud, so they can hear you. Can you hear me? Can anyone not hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay, sorry. How would they know? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <What's name>? what? <laughs> so um, I'm sitting here today because I am lucky enough to help produce the Act Human Rights Film Festival, which opens tonight at the Laurie Student Center Theater just across the plaza. Uh, so it's kind of a crazy day to be sitting here on a panel discussion about helping run a film festival when that's actually what's happening <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, I've been at Colorado State for four years. Um, my background is in communications and a little bit of marketing. I've had a varied career across the panel. I've worked with nonprofit organizations. I've worked with bicycle touring companies, ski companies. I've done a little bit of everything. I've been a um, Jill of all trades, master of none. So um, why I'm find myself with this festival is that within the department, which puts on the festival, um, I was just sort of asked by my boss to kind of help out. And um, thanks to that guy sitting over there, Dr. Different, whose idea the festival was, um, I just suddenly like, I had no uh, film festival experience, zero. Um, and so I was like, well, the first thing you probably need is a budget. So I just kind of figured out all the pieces that I needed to figure out. I started asking people questions who ran other film festivals, um, met a lot of folks. Um, we were charged the first year with just trying to raise money, which we're still working on. Um, but next thing you know, we have a nine day film festival here at CSU. It's one of the only human rights film festivals in the United States. It's one of the only ones that is produced through a university. Um, which makes it very different as opposed to being a film festival that runs uh, privately or through something like the, the Denver Film Festival. And Denver has a completely different structure than ours because we are a state institution and that um, changes a lot of what we can and can't do. Um, I'm happy to go into that later if anybody has any questions, but I think I'll just kind of leave it at that. You should come tonight, obviously. There's a program up front. Sorry, I have to do a plug. Yeah, so um, student tickets student tickets are, uh, what are they, $10 at the door if you don't have one. So yeah, there's so, food. So we invited Carol to trap you so that you have <laughs> So Sybil Gardner is next. Go ahead, Sybil. Thanks, Donald. Um, welcome. Uh, I was asked, I've known Donald since I moved here from Los Angeles four and a half years ago. Um, and... Um, I, I'm going to make this very quick, I guess. I always wanted to be in show business. I grew up in New York City on Staten Island, and whenever I would pass a film crew, I knew that's what I want to do. Um, so my first gig was as an intern on Good Morning America in, before you were born in 1977. And from there, I just got a lot of different experience on the production side of television. Uh, when I saw MTV in 1982, when it first came on, I said, that's what I want to do. So um, am I talking loud enough? OK. Uh, so I worked for years on the production side, producing, uh, writing for various things that in New York City where cable television was taking off in the 80s. And then um, worked on a lot of music videos, traveling around the country doing that um, until the company I worked for went out of business, which gave me the opportunity to have time to write my first screenplay. I didn't go to film school. I'm not a really a big um, advocate of going to film school if you want to be a writer, uh, because the job of a writer is to write. So write, write. Anyway, um, with one screenplay in hand in 1988, I moved to LA. 
um, and got a job as a writer's assistant. I worked on, you know, went from show to show to show until I ended up as an assistant on Law and Order when it first uh, was about to come on the air. Um, and I just kept bugging the writers all the time about my stupid ideas until they finally said, okay, if you, know, if you shut up, we'll let you write one. So that's how I got my start, by being pain in the ass. And um, that's what you all need to be if you want to be in show business. Um, and so I just wrote a lot of one-hour drama. But like so many people in show business, what I really always wanted to do was make movies. But all my feature film scripts would just keep getting me jobs on television shows. So finally, I moved here um, four and a half years ago and um, have been developing a couple of independent features. And there is a filmmaking community uh, here in Colorado. So I've met a lot of those people either through Donald or through people he's hooked me up with. And um, I'm collaborating with somebody um, on a project that I know I'm going to shoot. Um, I just, you know, I, it's the kind of thing where if show business is in your blood, you can never sort of get rid of it like herpes or something. Although, <laughs> not that I would know. It's a little herpes. bit more fun. <laughs> Depends. But, um, so, you know, I mean, till the day I die, um, I'm gonna be, coming up with ideas and projects and meeting other people. I love writers, I love film people. We're all a little bit crazy, you know, which you have to be to be in this industry. Um, but that's just what I've done and I'm really happy to be in Colorado and out of LA. And so. Why don't you talk a little bit about working on Nashville, which is a big network mm. show. In television, when you're a writer, it, traditionally, writers have been king in television because they oversee a whole series and know where the characters are going and the stories. They know the history of the show. And so the way that writers are elevated in television is they become producers. And oftentimes when an episode is being shot, the writer of that particular episode goes to the set and produces it. So. Um, I was really fortunate enough to be, my, one of my oldest friends was the showrunner for, meaning the head writer and producer for Nashville, and so she brought me on to work on the show, um, first when I was in LA, but then I kept working on it when I was here, so I would fly back to LA and work with the writers in the writer's room, and then fly back here, write an episode, and then fly to Nashville and be on the set and produce it. And I'm one of those writers that loves actors. A lot of writers hate actors, because um, they're you know, they're crazy in a different way from writers. Um, and so I love being on a set and working with, with the actors and with the director and the set, you know, the art, art directors, et cetera. In any event, that was the, the, the highlight of my career, the best thing I ever worked on, nobody saw. It was called Any Day Now. And it was um, the first one hour drama that Lifetime Television ever did. And it was about the civil rights movement. And it's just, mm -hmm. I can't understand why they never re-ran that show because it was amazing. Um, but I'm rambling, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so it's next up is rambling. Howie Mofshevitz, and I just want to say correction, even though here on this sheet it says KUNC, out there it says he's at Colorado Public Radio, where he used to be, and he quit. He quit, and now he went to KUNC. Go ahead, Howie. Thanks. So in 19... 70 in the spring, before your parents were born. Um, I was a graduate student in English literature at CU Boulder, and I was working in medieval literature. And I was walking along on the campus, and I ran into a friend from my group in graduate school who was with two guys from Chicago. Um, and it was during the week of the Conference on World Affairs on the Boulder campus, which is next week. Anyway, so she introduced me to these two guys, and one was a, a columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, and the other was a film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, and forgive the name dropping, but it was a guy named Roger Ebert who became a lot more famous afterwards. And Roger and I became friends, and I was not particularly connected to film in any way, or even that interested. Uh, but over the course of our friendship, um, I got more interested in film. And at the same time, are any of you film students? Um, at the same time, my best friend in graduate school was a woman named Linda Williams. And if you're in film studies, you've probably read her work. She's a significant film scholar um, and theorist now. And between Linda and Roger, I 
as somebody said to me one day, I veered. And I wrote a paper in my Beowulf seminar using film theory. Um, <laughs> I, I passed. Um, and then Linda and I started making short films, and I showed one of those films to a filmmaker friend on the East Coast who was a real filmmaker, and he said, you can't afford to do this. I said, no, I can't. And he said, well, I know people who found their way to um, production funds by way of being film critics. And he was talking about Richard Schickel, I believe, who was the, critic, the film critic at Time, Time Magazine. Anyway, so I thought about what he said, and I went to this little hippie radio station in Denver um, called uh, KCFR, and it, you know, and I said, "Do you want a film critic?" And they said, "Do some reviews." And so I did some, and they ran them. You know, I wrote them, they recorded them, they ran them. And so then they said, "Well, if you did it every week, it would be better." So I started to do it every week. And about 10 years later, I said to the president of what was then Colorado Public Radio, it got a lot bigger, I said, so why'd you take me? <laughs> and he said, well, a lot of people wanted to be the film critic, but you were the only one who wanted to do it. Um, and I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Um, it may, always made me think of how Richard Nixon got to be president, right, mm -hmm. just by banging his head on the door. Um, but... So I became the critic at, you know, I stayed at Colorado Public Radio for quite a long time. That got me connected to NPR, um, where I continue to do features when the spirit moves me and when it's, the spirit moves them. Um, and ultimately, instead of teaching Chaucer, I got a job at CU Denver teaching film. Um, and I still do it. <laughs> I well, like it. Very well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And uh, next we have Andrew Schneider. Andrew? Uh, well, thank you for uh, including me. It's a real honor to be here with such an incredible group of talent. Um, my own background in film and television started at a network called Current TV, um, which was owned by Al Gore uh, and Joel Hyatt. Um, the network launched two weeks before um, a brand you might have heard of called YouTube. And YouTube took a model of aggregating content. So anything anyone wanted to upload went right on. And that created some First Amendment issues and some other issues for them. But we really wanted to work with sort of uh, folks out of film school, applied journalism programs. Um, so we had, you had to have forms, paperwork, everything before we would even look at your project. And you could see where that went for them. Um, current TV for YouTube, um, whereas current TV wound up exiting through a sale to Al Jazeera. So in the, in the time that I was there at the network, my job was really doing two things. One is commissioning stories, and our format was three to seven minute segments about um, any issue that affects the life of what we were calling a, a millennial at the time. We, were, we, we figured that would catch on, and it did. Um, and, and then the other piece was going out, traveling to film festivals um, to buy the work of filmmakers and documentarians to put, to put on the network. Um, and then we had a team of what we called Predators, which were producer editors um, back in the editing bays. And so we would send content from festivals to them. We would go, I would travel and, and uh, hire shooters in towns to tell stories, everything from a race riot um, or political action to a sports game. Uh, if we wanted it, that, that was kind of our model. Um, you know, that model wound up doing really well with a $500 million sale. So I would say for $50 million purchase, starting with the US network that then expanded to the UK and then globally um, through Italy and then later Singapore, it was, a, it was a super cool project. But it was that time where new media was a brand new mm -hmm. phrase. Um, and the internet and devices really had not caught on at all. So my, my entry into film was, I think, very similar. You want to work on features, and you really want to always be telling the stories that are coming out of you as an artist. Um, but there are actually so many different immersive things that have come out of that. And, and so my work now here, coming back to Colorado, has really been to, to produce um, 
all kinds of new media and traditional filmmaking um, and cobble together a career living in a place um, that is incredibly rewarding to be a creative person uh, that's outside of the, the mainstream industry but still very well connected thanks to the efforts of Donald and a lot of folks um, at the state um, and in our community and, uh, and I'm happy to I'm here in Fort Collins as well, so happy to be kind of an ongoing resource for you all um, and part to tap you into the filmmaking community, which is really starting to boil up um, in incredible ways in Northern Colorado. Cool. So for somebody asked how many people are studying film or television, and I only saw a couple hands, so let's do that again. Okay. Okay, I, that's, that's all right, but you could be taking a course are there courses in film oh. and television? Okay. <laughs> that's, there, that's yeah. studying, isn't it? No? Depends. Okay. So let me you ask you, right. do you any of you interested in being in the industry? Show of hands. Oh, we got a lot of people. Yeah. So who here writes? Okay, and you're allowed to raise your hand multiple times. <laughs> who here wants to direct? Actors, actors. Cool. Okay, a few actors. And what about uh, film crew? Anybody interested? What are you interested in doing? Uh, audio or video or um, gaffing, anything? Uh huh. Post production? By the way, that's where the money is. <laughs> Just telling you, that's where the money is. So, okay, so the, the, most of the rest of the time we're going to be here, we're encouraging you to ask questions of any one of the five of us. Uh, that you think we might be able to answer. Who's up? Don't be shy. Taylor, what's your question? I have a question for Carol. Oh. What um, film festivals across Colorado or the United States or even internationally could you guys reach out to to form these teams? Good question. Yeah. Thanks, Taylor, for that awesome question. Um, well, the first festival that um, that I went to was the Human Rights Watch Festival in New York City um, by invitation of Dr. Different, who had already been to, I don't know how many festivals around the world. He had received a endowed chair through the College of Liberal Arts to uh, write a book about human rights film festivals and part of the work involved research. I would let you speak to that if you want to. Um, but at any rate, so we had a lot of international input in terms of the films we were looking at. Um, we talked with, you mentioned women in film in Colorado. We talked with a lot of people who had been in the Denver, or who are in the Denver area who were affiliated with, um, there's a Women Plus Film Festival. There's, I mean, I don't, I don't quite know how all of those are connected or They're not, not, They're connect, not. Connect, not connected. Well, Women Plus Film oh. is connected to the Denver Film Society. Right, okay. Which does the Denver Film and Festival. And then Women in Film in Colorado. Is that the one that Trey? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So Trey and I went to high school together. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Anyway, funny. so... Um, <laughs> Small world. Yeah, so then there had also been in Fort Collins. It lasted for about, I want to say three years, if anybody knows, the um, Tri-Media Film Festival. Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was about three years. It was about three years, and so the people who had put that together, it was an all-volunteer effort. Um, I reached out to them, and then I looked at film festivals. There's one in um, Bellingham, Washington. That's a completely volunteer-run human rights film festival. Um, reached out to Vermont. Um, that, that was the first uh, human rights film festival that formed in the United States. And but haven't and and then some of the folks at, at the Denver Film Center. But we haven't made as many inroads in that first year as we have after the fact. Um, there's a new festival that's starting just down the road in um, Loveland, the Horsetooth International Film Festival. Uh, it's coming online in the fall. It'll be their first um, ever one, so we're already making friends with them. Uh, so it was a lot of like computer research sometimes more than actual face-to-face, -face, which is what I know we, we did that as well, but it was, it was just kind of like, I mean, it's not my full-time job. I was employed part-time at CSU and was also putting together a film festival. So it was just sort of like, seat in my pants, what do I think makes sense? What do we need to do and who can, who can I meet? Oh, critical in the story actually is um, our director of operations the first couple of years, Christy King. She was, had been director of operations for a human rights film festival that occurred at a, and, uh, oh, what's that? It's, 
in Denver. Uh, the L, it's a woman's name. I can't remember. It's like a school, but it is like a, anyways, a one-off. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so it was a one-off event and I, because I, she was one of the few people who actually returned my call. Um, the festival really kind of became what it did because Christy came on board and we used her expertise and professionalism to really help map out what our festival currently looks like. So it was definitely outside help that we relied on heavily. Questions? Yes. Uh, this would be for Sybil and I guess uh, if anyone else wants to chime in. Um, I thought it was interesting how you moved from, you started in LA and then moved to Colorado for your career? I started in New York and um, then LA and then Colorado. Okay. Would you say there's viability in starting in Colorado now or would you say you kind of have to have a credential set up from working in somewhere like uh, LA or New York? I think it really completely depends on what you want to do. There is production here, so if you are interested in learning about art department or um, being a gapper, you could definitely meet enough people here so that you could learn a trade. Um, to be a, a television writer, you really need to be in LA. Okay. Um, maybe New York, because there are a few, few things done there, but um, most of the shows, uh, the writing staffs are in Los Angeles. But you know, I have, I have to preface it by saying, actually I'm not prefacing it, I'm post commenting on the fact that um, technology has just changed so much over the course of my career and so I don't like to make pronouncements like that because with um, web series and um, YouTube shows, YouTube, my, my 16 year old daughter's best friend is a YouTube star who um, has two million like viewers or something like that and he lives in Longmont where we live. I mean Jake Warden is his name, you might know him. And, so who would have ever guessed that when I started out in the business? But if you want to be on a show that's on Netflix or ABC or whatever, then LA is the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll add to that if I may, yeah. which is that there's you know, recent developments, um, Card 6, uh, or is it Deck 6? The, the, they Deck do nine. games. Deck 9. Deck 9. But they have a full-time writing room here in Colorado. Yeah. Um, and they have about 65, 70 people who work here. What town are they in? Yeah, or Westminster. They're in Westminster. Yeah. And they're growing quickly, and they make uh, video games. Right, Go ahead. yeah. I'm sorry and to do, do uh, not just sort of action stuff, but really immersive, uh, well, empathetic storytelling in, in those games. Does anybody know Cyanide and Happiness? There's a, a web series and a, a TV show that NBC has on one of their um, stations. That's produced in, in a two-room suite at the Downtown Artery in Fort Collins. It's a multi-million dollar annual production, but their creative offices, they moved here from Dallas um, for the quality of life. And, and as you say, the technology really makes these things possible. They, the way that they operate, they have a team in, in the UK, they still have their team in Texas, but everything is done by Skype, so all three studios are linked up all the time, and it's like they're working together. So, um, you know, if you're it, if you want to go, it kind of depends on the route. If you want to be entrepreneurial and you're really into creating your own kind of content and and taking the world by storm, like Cyanide and Happiness, there's that model. Um, stuff is starting to come on if you really want to start as an assistant and work your way up through those t traditional industry channels, and both are, I think, equally. Um, valuable and both are now becoming available in Colorado. And it also depends on how much money you want to make. I mean, typical television writer, when they're working, and you know, there's a lot of time when you're not working or you're working for free, but when you're working, you're making a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so if, you know, so much of it, I think, applies to anything in life, is really examining your motives. Do you, do you want to do something because you have a story to tell or you have many stories to tell? Do you want to do something because you want to be J.J. Abrams, you know, and be like big and, you know, make a lot of money and be famous? Do you want to do it just because you're an artist? You know, once you figure some of that stuff out, um, it's easier to make those decisions about big life decisions like moving and stuff. So there is opportunity here, and there's opportunity elsewhere. You decide. Who's up? 
Yes, young lady. Um, so this is a question for everyone. So why aren't they still spending the Quran Well, let me answer that. So uh, filming, film production is an incentive-driven business. So by way of example, the state of New Mexico spends, has been spending $50 million a year on film incentives to get people to shoot there. And they just passed the bill to up it to $110 million a year. Utah spends $8.8 .8 <laughs> million a year. Georgia, unlimited, no cap. Uh, New York, $425 million a year. California, $330 million a year. We spend $750,000 a year. $750,000 versus $110 million. So where do you think they're going to go? They're going to come here to get a piece of the $750,000? Or you think they're going to go to New Mexico to get a piece of the 110 million? I mean, so we're trying to change that, but it's been a difficult ride, I must say. But that's why. And we are, we have gotten some, we've gotten Fast and Furious 7 came here and did all their second unit work. We had The Hateful Eight come here. We had a couple Netflix movies come here because we had a little bit of money. Um, we're working on a, a, a getting a couple scenes from a major motion picture here in the in next month, but if we want to get major production here, which we can get, we just have to have some incentive money. And I, I don't. It, it may not be appropriate for for Donald to advocate because he's the commissioner and a, and a state employee. But as residents of Colorado, you can raise your voice. Let your legislators know that that's important. And, and a piece that can help, the National Governors Association just came out with a new economic uh, study. And I know none of you got into this panel because you were interested in economics. But it, <laughs> as you're advocating, I think it's important to understand that arts and culture industries, including filmmaking and, um, and, and media, is a larger contributor to national GDP than is uh, construction, mining, um, and a handful of other other industries that, that we tend to think of as top industries and that your legislators tend to, to really bend over backwards to net in state. So this is no different from, from the uh, tens and tens of millions of dollars spent on economic development in the state and it makes a huge impact um, towards the viability of filmmakers and uh, careers here in the state. And, and thank you, Andrew, and it's also a major Content creation is a major export of the United States. People watch film and television or whatever, games that are made here uh, all over the world and they sell for a lot, of, a lot of money comes in to the United States as a result of that. So yes, have your parents call, have anybody in your family who can vote call your state legislator. That's the only way it's gonna happen. Come on, somebody. Yes. So, uh, a couple of you guys mentioned uh, marginalized community in northern Colorado. How do you go about contacting the people in that community or getting involved with it? One way is, um, and I don't know, it's is Denver northern Colorado? <laughs> okay. Well, what, like we mentioned, there is an organization called Women um, WIFMCO, Women in Film and Media in Colorado and uh, just Google it. And if you start going to some of their events, they have things every month. They have film fairs and um, all kinds of different or, you know, activities. And just start meeting people. I know Boulder has a community of um, documentary filmmakers. And there's also, um, what's that? Do you know, Andrew, the name of that? There's a, a group that meets once a month in Boulder that used to be called like the independent film something it meant it met at uh, Boulder Digital mm -hmm. Arts and they changed they the name of it they still meet though they I, still meet on meetup.com you meet can up. find that there's another one for writers called writers of the purple page <laughs> which I, I don't know anyone involved with it but I just love the name of that and they're yeah. all screenplay writers um, a little closer to home here or a little closer to campus there's a resource online which is N O C O M U V I noco movie and it's the Northern Colorado Music and Video Cluster Initiative, which is actually a partnership between 
CSU, the City of Fort Collins, Bohemian Foundation in the Music District, uh, the nonprofit that I founded, Create Places, uh, Lyric Cinema, Rocky Mountain PBS. We've worked with the film office to present um, at some happy hours content and, and do that kind of stuff. So on the website, you'll find meetups uh, locally as well as links to contact information for those different organizations. Um, and, and like I say, I'm, I'm out here, so if, if there's um, uh, a connection that I can help make to a local crew or a project that's going on, any of the festivals that happen in Fort Collins, um, Steve Roberts is very well connected and can get you in touch directly with me or any projects you're interested in. Um, so it's, not a, it's just kind of a web, uh, you know, probably out of date. We try and keep up with it, but it's, it is a, a connected enough community that I think you can find a door and reach all of us. Yeah. Um, and we're, generally speaking, I find the filmmaker community is really interested in helping each other out. And, and so I would say to just take the initiative and you'll be rewarded. Yeah, and, and um, I always suggest that people um, volunteer. Like, um, if you meet somebody and they are gonna be doing a shoot, say, can I just come and be a PA, production assistant, and just volunteer for a day. You'll meet the entire crew, get everybody's number. Sorry. Um, Do you still need volunteers for your fest? No, we only, have, we only need one. You know, go to a set and just start meeting people and, um, and asking them, Do you, can I take you to coffee? And ask you how you got into the business. And then offer to buy somebody a cup of coffee and just pick their brain and find out. And then they'll you know, say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And then be very proactive. And you know, don't forget that there are a lot of companies here that make content, all the news organizations, we have television stations in a lot of places. Uh, we have Rocky Mountain PBS. We have Colorado Public Television. Um, they have internships at these places. It's a good way to get started in the business and learn about the news business. And that's a business that even though it's, it seems a little shrunken because the technology has changed, like now a, a reporter can go out by himself and and, and, uh, and uh, shoot something and then come back and edit it, whereas it used to be a, 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 a team. But, uh, but they still need people. They're always gonna need people. Okay, I, oh, go ahead. No, no, you can. Oh, uh, thanks. Um, you know, our festival, we have a lot of volunteers that we lean on, and um, one of them is in the back of the room. She actually created our trailer last year as a CSU student. Um, she's graduated now and she made our trailer again this year and um, she's getting attention from uh, some of our distributors who are like, wow, this is really amazing work that she's doing. So there are a lot of ways that you can patchwork yourself into the industry, I think, through film festivals. We have mm -hmm. um, a lot of tech people that work the back end for us. Um, we have um, operations person. So there's it's not just uh, that you're going to a festival and watching films. Like it, everything that is involved in getting those onto the screen requires a tremendous amount of work. So if you're on the PR and marketing side, there's room for you. If you are into business side of things, there's room for you. So volunteering at festivals around the Col around Colorado would be a, a great way for you to experience, uh, meet people, meet filmmakers, uh, and uh, you know just get a. It, that would be a really safe way to get a lot of, to get introduced. What I mean by safe is that you don't have to put out a lot of time or money other than just volunteering. So, yeah. and usually you get to hang out and watch the films too. Yeah. So, the Telluride Film Festival at this very moment is looking for people to be in. I think they call it their production assistant program. I forget the the exact name of it. If you go to the Telluride Film Festival website and hunt around, you can get it. Or if everything else fails, just call them up. Um, but what they do is they bring in ten or ten to fifteen people, I think, six weeks before the festival, and you actually build the festival. Um, it's an extraordinary experience. Many of the f many of the best filmmakers in the world say that Telluride is the best festival and you make wonderful contact there. Um, the people who do this, I understand, have great fun. Um, you get called a Vespucci dog, and if you do it, you get to know what that means. Uh, and 
I think it's, if you have the time, it's really worth doing. I believe they pay minimum wage. I th do you know, Taylor, if they do? I don't know, but I would yeah. plug that Colorado does have almost 80 film festivals across the United States, and so it's a really good outlet, I guess, yeah. to really put yourself in. Yeah. 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 And I tell you, I do work, the head of this program is an architect slash theater designer named Brant Garber, who's very good. And he's a good guy, too. The Denver Film Society is a really great organization, mm -hmm. and so um, it's not expensive to join. And they have so many different kinds of film festivals. There's one in Estes Park for the Horror Film Festival, and the one uh, Women Plus Film Festival, which is separate from Women in Film in Colorado. Um, that's from April this April 9th to the 14th. Um, and so when you go to those events, um, a lot of them take place at the C Film Center on Colfax, and they have a little um, bar and you know socializing area. And there's always a lot of, of the people in the film community who kind of hang out and just schmooze. There's also the Colorado Film and Video Association. Um, you can join that. Uh, people who are in the business are in, that are in this area, like the Triangle, Denver. Fort Collins, Boulder, uh, generally join that. And then they have uh, mixers and d parties regularly. So you can go to things like that and meet people who are work in the industry. And there's a lot of people who work in the industry uh, who work on commercials. And people don't think about that. But you know, a lot of these commercials pay very well. A lot of them are union uh, pay. and. Uh, and they come here because they want, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, a Durango truck, you want to go up Pikes Peak or something. So they like the mountains, and they need to hire local people. They're, they're, they'll come in with a couple people from wherever they are, but the crew is all local. The Telluride Film Festival also has what's called the Telluride Film Festival Student Symposium, uh, which is a program for college students. And I say we because I started it and I'm one of the teachers. Uh, and it's too late for this year, but uh, because applications go in in March, and, you know, anyway, the festival's over Labor Day weekend. And if accepted, because we could only take, we only have funding for 50 people, you come to the festival, which is free, the festival itself, we find a cheap way for you to stay and cheap ways for you to eat. And every day there are, there's an early morning class to talk, and then there are two 45-minute sessions in the afternoons, back-to-back uh, -back with people who are the best filmmakers in the world. And then you see a minimum of four movies a day, and you are exhausted, nobody sleeps. And the students every year say, and, and Linda, my, Linda Williams is my co-teacher, um, we're, you know, we're sort of the MCs of it, um, people say over and over that it changes their life. And you do not have to be a film student. In fact, we look for people who are not film students. Can I do it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to be within a year of graduation. And you can be a graduate student. And you, literally, you can be in any, any area. It doesn't matter what your major is. We love biology majors or people who are physics and religion majors or anything, you know, so that they're not just straight film majors. <laughs> Okay. So what did, oh, go ahead, please. Well, I don't even know if my question is completely appropriate, but I've been a filmmaker. Andrew has supported me in the past. Um, I am independent, work with one other partner. We shoot it and do everything ourselves. And we have a very hard time finding funding. And we are really looking not even to fund ourselves, but to fund local artists and musicians and, and and animators so our film can look cool and get into the hearts of our viewers because we have to have the art. So we have been, I would say for this project, we've tried really hard for two years to, to find funding. And we have done everything from the launch party for a community funded, we've, we've just written a lot of letters and uh, we're not a nonprofit so we can't apply for those kinds of things and uh, we've applied for grants and 
you know, we're kind of stuck because we don't want to ask the artist to work for free because one of our other films was kind of about that. And we have a musician, we have all of our people ready to hire, but we don't know how to find funding for this part of our film. So you, you've tried crowdfunding, I assume. We did. Yeah. And we had a great party and we raised $3,800 and that was super, but we spent it on the reenactment and paid all the actors for that and then that's gone. <laughs> well, um, what I'm going to say is going to sound ridiculous, but you find cafes where rich people hang out and you hang out. Try to meet them. <laughs> Try to meet them. I mean, you, you know, it's, uh, a lot of it is, a lot of uh, film finance literally is some wealthy person uh, bumps into somebody and they've never made a film and they buy into the fact that they could produce a movie by putting up the money and they do it. I mean, frequently they'd never do it again, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but the, the fact is that there are people out there who will, who want to produce movies, who want to be an executive producer of a movie. And for those people, we kind of get on Netflix, we look at people who fund other projects that are kind of like ours, you know, we've reached out to these people. I don't know, maybe we'll just have to. I think, honestly, I think if you look for people who are already doing it, they're not going to be, they're not going to show much interest. Uh, one, one of the things I think you'll find out here in Colorado is that there are a lot of people with means who have not been approached. If you go to Los Angeles or New York, uh, everybody has been asked to put money in a movie or whatever, and, or a Broadway show or something, and, and, and they generally have lost money and they don't do it again. And, uh, you know, here that's not the case. I think that there are a lot of people here who, uh, but, uh, but it's a networking thing. You have to meet people and you have to convince somebody who has the means to come in and that you're, th that you're gonna actually make something with their money and, and it's gonna be something that's promising. And the connections are often entirely obscure. The yeah. San Francisco Silent Film Festival is largely underwritten by a mattress company, and um, which has no discernible connection to <laughs> silent film. And um, the great French master Jean Renoir uh, made a, one of his greatest films called The River. It was financed by a shoe manufacturer. People and, like to connect to the movies if you can find them. So if you went to the opening night at the uh, at the Boulder Film Festival or opening night at the Denver Film Festival or any of the red carpet events which are the tickets are expensive believe me there are people there who love film who have money who have never put money in a film and you know it's a matter of meeting the right people I mean I hate to say it and you know I I've produced a lot of movies in the first movie I produced, uh, I went to friends and got them to put up money, but the director also had gone to college with a guy whose family had money and he put in $100,000, you know, and, you know, and, 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 if, and, and I, I, I believe this is going to sound totally trite, but if you don't ask, you don't get. You got to ask, and you got to ask politely, and uh, I've something I've said over and over again, if you want to be a producer, you have to be uh, persistent, but not quite a pest. You know, and you, and, and just, and you get a lot of no's, you mainly get no's. I mean, I've produced a, a, quite a few feature films and I'm working on projects now. Most people you approach say no, but if you let that get to you and you say, oh my God, everybody says no, if you knock on a hundred doors, one will open. I mean, and that's really it. You've got to knock on a hundred doors, maybe a thousand doors. But, but all it takes is the one that opens and you'll get your movie made. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just persistence. Be persistent. Okay. 
Yes, the gaffer. Oh, uh, yeah, this question is kind of in the same vein, but with any of y'all's experience um, with underwriters like uh, providing funding, um, how much oversight or have the sponsorships had on productions, or what does that look like? <laughs> well, I, I think it depends. I mean, first of all, generally it's not sponsors who put up money. You know, I found that when you approach a, a, a sponsor type company and you're looking for something, their approach is always, well, how many people are going to see this? Who's your distributor? And if you, in independent film, uh, I did, I've made, uh, produced 20 independent films, only two had, two were with Paramount, so we had a distributor. The others, I don't know where it's going to end up. You know, you, you hope to get into a major film festival, you hope it ends up getting distribution, and I've been lucky I've gotten them into major film festivals, but when I went to an airline and I said, hey, I'm making a film with Elijah Wood in London, and I'm looking for some free first class tickets, they'd say, well, who's your distributor? And I'd say, I don't have one. They would never give me any money. So, you know, I don't know. There, there, there are people who are getting money now from companies that want to do product placement. I, I've never had a lot of success. I've gotten some. You know, uh, we've had uh, somebody provide a lot of uh, costuming and give it, to, give it to us for free because they wanted to see a movie star wearing it. But... Uh, I don't know if that really answers your question or if I got off base. No, no it does. Yeah, I was just curious from like, like the collaborative how, process of the different components that make the production happen. Well, yeah. well, one of the things that I think you're lucky about now is when I first uh, started to produce in 1994, which is also probably before you were born, you know, you you main, most people shot on 35 millimeter film so the cameras were massive the film costs were huge and you couldn't just go make something and now you know you could you could you could make something and you could get a bunch of your friends and make something and youtube and places like that you never know i mean then your 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 uh, your your daughter's friend who has two million followers, I mean, you, you could make something, if you do something really clever, very different, all of a sudden people will pay attention to you. And it's not, it's not gonna work for everybody, but it's a, it's a tough world to get into. I mean, if you decide you wanna be a rock star, what are the chances of becoming a rock star? But it, there's no chance if you don't try. And Oh, go ahead. You to first, and then we yeah. have a young lady back here. There's, there's a lot of great opportunities in branded content and great brands to work with. So if, if you feel like your values line up, I would just encourage you, if you, do, if you are going out and self-producing and looking for funding, that you, one, make some friends in the finance school. I mean, it's not, it's not too late That's uh, actually before you graduate <laughs> um, to, get a, to get an education and maybe even a business partner on that front. And then two, to, to set your own boundaries as the artist and the maker about what, what you're gonna do. And from my stance, if, if you're financing the production, meaning you want your money back at the end of it, then there's a trust relationship there that's really important. And I want them to be a partner on issues of distribution and them getting their money back, but not on the creative, right? So, so make, make your own boundaries. Um, and, and network with other filmmakers who are really in reaching the audiences that, that you want to reach to find out how they did it. Reach out to them online. I think a lot of folks um, will, will plug in there, but don't feel like you've got to take whatever the money says to do, unless you're doing branded content. And like I say, that's a, a totally great way um, to go about it. So I got off topic when the, one of the projects we did with Paramount, they totally told us what to do. I mean, they, you know, they, they were all over us on every single shot, every issue, you know, and it was v very unpleasant. But most of the independent films I've done haven't been like that at all. We got the money. I mean, we'd have a bond company frequently, 
it would be bonded. And so weekly you do a cost report. As long as you weren't running over budget, they left you alone. Yeah. There's a great, um, just a fun short story, but a, a good friend of mine um, is a creative director and, and became a showrunner on RuPaul's Drag Race, which was a, a show that just started with from the heart of RuPaul and in its first couple seasons was a really small production on um, a network called Logo and it had maybe three executive producers. The season later went to VH1 and all of a sudden there were 12 executive producers, one from each network and the production co and and so then you had a lot of voices at, at the table um, and, and most of them representing dollars um, and in those cases, sometimes, yeah, they, the, the executive at the network is going to look at, at the cut before you go to picture lock and say, you know, no, get that, I'm going to pull that shot that doesn't go out with our name on it uh, type of stuff. So that it does exist. And if you can avoid that, you're doing a good thing. You know, there's also a lot of opportunities that people don't think about. You know, there's all kinds of companies in your wherever you live that want uh, to create a commercial or a website or content for the website. And, and a lot of them have no idea how to do it or they don't think they have the money to do it. So if you went to some car dealer and said, I, 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 I see you're not doing this or you're doing it, but I, I think I could do something for you at a really great price, you never know. I mean, you can sell your services and start to create content and make a living creating content and then maybe segue into doing something else with content. But once you're a, a proven content creator, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah. But not in Fort Collins, because our production company already does all the dealerships. Oh, OK. So don't He's got <laughs> don't undercut us, <laughs> please. But, but call him. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, please. Hi. Um, I'm, this question isn't directed at anyone specifically, so um, I'm curious about your opinion on film school. I've heard um, advice in, two to, in both ways, like going versus not going, just getting an internship, you know, starting at the bottom, working your way up, and getting through the industry that way. And I've also heard success stories of people that went on to film school and that worked their way. Um, that way. I know, I'm just curious on your uh, thoughts on that. Well, I think we could all weigh in on that, but I don't think any of us went to film school. And, and I think it depends on what you want to do. You know, we have some really good film schools here, and if you want to be on, uh, if you want to start on a crew and work your way up, film school is the way to go because they really teach you how to do everything. Uh, I've, I'm a producer. I don't know how to do any of those things. I mean, like none of them. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a writer, you don't have to go to film school. But I, um, I applied to one film school when I was 28 years old and got rejected. And I'm really thankful because I would have been in major debt. And um, it, it, will, it really wouldn't have benefited me because what I ended up doing as a writer's assistant, um, I got to work with writers who were willing to read my stuff and give me honest feedback. I made contacts by working on the Universal Studios lot for five years. Um, I think the people that I know who like went to USC Film School, the benefit for them is that they made so many connections with people and they come up through the ranks with those people and they're still like the USC film people, they're connected and they hire each other. So it's good for networking, but for actually r learning how to write, you can get five books that tell you, you know, story by Robert McKee. Uh, I yeah. can give you the names of books to get. That's how I started, I read one book on screenwriting and then I just kept writing and writing and writing and finding people. Uh, who would give me great feedback and joining writers groups and I incurred no debt that way so that's my opinion. And writing is a craft and you have to do it over and over again to get better at it. The first screenplay anybody writes 
sucks. I mean, McKee, yeah, Robert it, McKee in his book says it takes 10 screenplays to write a good one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that, but yeah. It might take 20. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. You might never get there. Yeah. yeah. There's also free yeah. online film schools, which are incredibly <laughs> valuable. So, and, and typically, any community that you're in, the Bay Area has probably the best one, but there are free public media organizations, Fort Collins Public Media. They've got cameras, post stuff. Um, so if you want to go learn how to be on a set and what those, I call them daily habits, of filmmaking for a writer, it's specific, but it, it's the things that you need to know um, to actually function on a set and, and not and get hired again the second time. <laughs> to be hired again, I think, is the biggest piece. Well, I teach in a film school, um, so I better be, I better be very careful about what I say. Uh, I think that we teach many useful things, and along the lines of what Donald said, uh, the, a lot of craft. You know, um, you learn basic things about camera. You learn basic things about editing. You learn basic things about writing and so on. But I tend to think that if you're interested, for instance, in being a filmmaker, in even remotely as an artist, that you don't necessarily learn to write or to make films by studying those things specifically and in a limited way. I think that people who want to make films ought to read philosophy and theater and poetry and learn something about painting. Mm -hmm. um, Good point. Look, I just, I just finished a story that's going to be on NPR, I think, on Monday on All Things Considered. And it's about a new film by the British director Mike Lee, who is a very great filmmaker. And the film is about an actual historical incident in 1819 in which peaceful 60,000 peaceful demonstrators in Manchester in England were attacked by the military because they were asking for the vote. Uh, and if you talk to Mike Lee, which I was lucky enough to do, it's incredible how attuned he is to understanding history, to understanding politics, to understanding economics, to understanding painting, to, you know, I mean, and on and on and on. And I think that if you want to, if you really want to be a filmmaker, you know, know something about art, know something about the world, and have something that you want to make films about. You know, if you simply have the technical skills Oh, yeah, you can shoot and you can cut, blah, 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 blah. What do you want to make a film about? You know, what do you want to film? Why do you want to do it? And I don't think you learn that in film school. Yeah. I would, I would I totally agree with everything you're saying, and I would add to that, become a student of people. I learned more about people from riding the New York subway and listening to how people talk and their conversations and just eavesdropping on everybody um, to just really try to understand what motivates people, why... Um, a lot of writers kind of have a love-hate relationship with people. Um, and so, yeah, get out there in the world and, and watch. I'll, I'll tell another story, if I may. Um, there's a very, one of the very greatest filmmakers, period, died last week. A woman named Agnes Varda, Agnes Varda, uh, French. She changed the cinema. Period. She invented the French New Wave five years before any of the boys got into the act. And she, if, you know, those of you who are women who are thinking that you can go into film, one reason you think that is that Agnes Varda did it in the 50s and continued to do it until last month. And she died, she was almost 91. And I knew her. And one day, she, we were walking down her street in Paris, and she walked me in, it goes along with what you say, she walked me into a really scruffy bar, and she said, stay here for a while, I'll be back. Just watch the people. This is, these are the faces of France. And she had an incredible sense of observation, you know? Um, and all of those things play into it. You know, it's not that you, you know, you can't make a beeline, say, I'm going to be a filmmaker and I'm going to, you know, learn A, B, C, D, and I'm gonna, then I'm going to be a filmmaker. You've got to know the world. Mm -hmm. So get off your cell phones. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Can you add to one of the unique things about the film 
mentioned about the difficulty of distribution and exhibition beyond the festival circuit. You had two films that were distributed by Parma. Could you elaborate on that? I think that's very important for students to learn because some of the, our guests in the past, they complain about how Netflix dropped distributing independent films or independent documentaries anymore. They just wanted to be their own network original content distributor. So I think beyond the festival, what should the independent filmmakers be looking Well, first of all, I think that there's real good opportunity right now because there are way more distributors than there ever were. I mean, uh, the, most of the time when I was making movies, um, there were a handful of uh, major distributors and, and, uh, and then a bunch of smaller ones and, and it was very hard to get any significant distribution. And I, my luck was that I would always work with uh, very talented people and we had extraordinary good luck getting into really top film festivals. So I've had three movies premiere at Sundance. Uh, I've had uh, uh, two premiere at South by Southwest, one which won the Grand Jury Prize and the Audience Award. I had three at uh, Tribeca. I had four at the Toronto International Film Festival. And if you get into films, like, if you get into festivals like that, the buyers will all watch it. Because that's the hard part. The hard part is not, the hardest thing is getting anybody to watch it. You think, oh, I made a film, of course they're going to watch it. No, they won't want to spend, you know, 90 minutes or longer watching your film unless somebody has put their imprimatur on it. A major film festival has stamped it and said, we like this film. And even uh, films that play Sunday, and some of them don't get any real distribution. So I recommend when somebody is making an independent film, their first shot should be to try to get into one of the top North American festivals and or European festivals, Berlin, you know, Edinburgh, all the, all the, there's a lot of film festivals where you can, you know, make, make your mark. Mm -hmm. and, and then chances are, if you get into one of those film festivals, you're gonna find a distributor. You, you might not get any money, but at least people are going to see it. Yeah. And, and that's an important part of it as well. And another thing that happens is that people in my line of work may write about it. And, and that's the thing. If you get into a film festival in a major, in a, in a major market and, and uh, the right critic writes about it, um, all of a sudden it's got a, a whole new uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, today there are all these platforms that you can also get on. So, and I, I think theatrical release is overrated. It's uh, ridiculously expensive. You never, you have almost no chance as an independent if you get a theatrical release of ever making any money. Because the, the, the game plan for the distributor is they look at your ancillary rights, your television rights, and your other distribution rights, and they say, what's the worst case? What's the least amount of money we're going to get for that? And then they'll say, that's how much we'll spend on advertising. And they'll spend that, and they take their fee, and they take their money back, and you get zero. Mm -hmm. So today, uh, I mean, if you are lucky enough to get, get on uh, Netflix or, or Amazon or something, or, you know, I, I've been lucky. I had uh, one movie we made independently. We really wanted a theatrical release. And then HBO bought it for a couple million dollars, and they released it prime time. Uh, the the second ep the second year of The Sopranos, which you guys are probably too young to know, but it was a huge TV series, and they they built it as Gangster Night. They showed the first episode of the second uh, season of Sopranos, and they showed our movie, and and we had a, we had Alec Baldwin in it. We had a good cast, you know, so that that of course helped. But we and the movie was. So played Sundance, but anyway, um, and then another movie I made that got a lot of distribution, it, it uh, premiered on Showtime. So, you know, but festivals, that, that movie also, uh, that premiered at, uh, at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, 
and that led to its sale. Knowing that uh, we've got about five more minutes okay. for Q and A. Uh, there's a class coming in here at three. So okay. Five more minutes, um, and then students will have a chance to maybe come up and meet you in person too. So, so much for three. Okay. About five more minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, knowing, knowing the acquisitions people at networks is a short circuit in, in both finance and distribution. Because um, they, they'll typically, you know, if, you, if you're on an email list or something where they're telling you what they're looking to acquire or you, you have their ear to say, you know, I have this really great thing and I'm coming to you first, there's, there's a market there um, outside of festivals for shorter mm -hmm. content too. So. Before you get yeah. to, to, to the feature film and the festival level, start those relationships. And also pay attention to the fact that getting to the audience is great, but for the beginning of the career, where you're at now, it's just great to get in front of juries and to have critics and mentors and people who've been in the industry. I've, I've been doing this for quite a while. You know, College is 10 years behind for me, and I'm still in that mode of every connection is moving to the next one. So. Pick, pick where you're going to start and pick those relate, just start developing those relationships and think of yourself as you're going to have a life in the arts, a life in this, in this. So you want those relationships to be more than just transactional and can I get the money from this network? Because um, those people are going to move networks over time. So just start, shift that mindset away from just give me the bucks to what Howie talks about, where's the art and what I'm making and, and in, creating good relationships because it, it's a nutty business and um, it, but there are people who look out for each other and, and, and that never ends you never stop trying to make relationships because there's always new important people who come into the system and they don't know you and and foreign sales companies are another thing important for relationships you want to sell your movie all over the world and and by the way you get with a good foreign sales company um, and a company you never heard of, but they're good, they will help you get into the film festivals. Yep. Yes, sir. In regards to writing, uh, what's the best strategy to just get content out to people that can actually make movies? Sybil, that's you, I think. Can you be more specific? After coming up with an idea or writing a treatment or screenplay or anything that you can show somebody, what is the best way to show the right people who can get that movie made? Well, <laughs> um, like Donald was saying, getting a movie made these days is um, a Herculean task. Um, I would say if you want to, um, nobody's really going to read a treatment from an unknown writer. Um, if you wrote a really fantastic screenplay um, and started showing it to people, you know, go to a writer's group and then ask for contacts, you know, it will end up being read by somebody who can help you if it's really great. Don't show people in Hollywood mediocre stuff because you only get one shot. And so if you wrote a screenplay that you thought was pretty good, but, you know, you really didn't have feedback from from people who know what the standard, the gold standard is, um, and you gave it to say an agent or somebody connected in Hollywood and they read it and realized, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not implying that you're not a great writer, you might be a great writer, but if it wasn't up to the standard, then somebody looks at your name and they're like, ugh, and they're not gonna read your next thing. So you've gotta make sure that your work is really top notch before you want to start giving it to people who can help you. Um, as far as treatments go, the only real reason to write a treatment is for yourself for the next step to write the screenplay. Or if you have a very like high concept idea with a lot of uh, detail and you want to protect yourself, you then could register that with the Writers Guild of America. And then um, if somebody stole your idea, you, know, you would have uh, proof that it was yours. Um, but I really like what Donald was saying about the fetish that we have about the big screen feature films. I think things have really just changed and there's so many more opportunities uh, to do other kinds of content uh, that aren't as um, impossible. I'll also quickly just add that our office has a free screenplay program for Colorado residents only. It's Yeah, this is important. 
really, if you have a screenplay, you want to get notes, send it to Taylor. On their website, Colorado Film Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, we'll get it read and you'll get notes. And, and what Sybil's saying is really important. It's easy for, it's common for everybody to think their work is great. And, and what you, you got to get people who have not had a look at it to look at it and give you notes. And you have to be willing to take the notes. And there are a lot of people out there who are like, oh, no, you're wrong. My thing is great. That person is not going to get anywhere. Get the notes. Have, have, join a writer's group. You know, there are, there are writers. We, a couple were mentioned. The Lighthouse also is one in Denver. Mm -hmm. You know, get people to read it and get their notes. And people will say to you, you know, here's a story, here's a plot flaw, or this was too obvious, and why don't you try this, and they'll, they'll help you make it better. Yeah. Don't send it to anybody until it's great. What Sybil said is correct. If they read something, if you send something, and this is true for a producer, if, if I like something and I send it and, it does, and it's lousy, that person I send it to will never read another thing I send them ever for the rest of their lives. That's it. One shot. And on a really fundamental level, use spell check. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. That, that, no, I'm, I am not kidding. Because if somebody reads a couple of spelling mistakes on the first page of your script, it goes in the trash. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when I started, it was really, really hard to get a screenplay. I remember somebody had a copy of Annie Hall and was like, you'd make a copy of it and you know it was like gold mm -hmm. now you can just read screenplays they're available all over the place so I would say that is a really important um, exercise that you can do to help yourself I think we're out of time oh, one more did you say one more all right we don't have one more hey thanks everybody thank you thank you you guys, nice to meet you. Nice, nice to, to see you again. You too. Nice to meet you.